Hello, and welcome to The Office Field Guide. I'm Chris, and we're reviewing every episode of The Office. Today we're looking at The Merger. The Merger was written by Brent Forrester, a reoccurring writer-director for The Office, and it was directed by Ken Winningham. This episode is the eighth of the third season of The Office, and it aired on November 16th, 2006. It was viewed by over 8.6 million people. And the setup is that we're following the Stanford employee's first day at the Scranton branch, and it goes about as well as you'd expect. Excuse me? You are fired. I'm sorry, but we don't have quitters on this team. All right, and so we have a lot to get to today. We're gonna to be looking at some great bits and dissecting how this episode may be an allegory for desegregation in America. So you're in for a treat. As always, let's get to the trivia. The trivia for the merger is what vehicles do Dwight and Andy drive during this point in time in the series? Bonus points if you know the year of Dwight's car. But with that, let's get into this one. No one uh, asked you anything ever. Okay, I have a lot to say about this episode and a lot of it's gonna be in the deeper meaning. So let me use this sequence to just call out some of my favorite things about this episode. To start off with, the quote banquet hall. The official merger day, all family welcome breakfast, come on in. Seems to only consist of champagne and what is that, salmon? I don't know, it's random and I love it. Hey, champagne. No, no, guess only. Dwight is the darling of this episode though. Dwight's Japanese concentration camp thing. I always wondered how they chose the man who was to die. Dwight turns childlike in demeanor when he's explaining how good of a job he could have done. I think I would have been good at choosing the person but Dwight's insistence that someone be fired is a slight homage to the UK office when Gareth insists that several of the newly absorbed employees be let go. And speaking of the original UK version, David Brent makes a comment in the same episode stating that he would never put employees up on a table because of health code reasons and all that. So another homage to the UK version. But back to Dwight. His interactions with Andy in this episode are priceless. And this feud lasts quite a while, but they have some great moments together in the series. Almost heaven, West Virginia, Blue Ridge Mountain, Shenandoah River, in German! And obviously I'm saying Dwight and Andy, but clearly Ed Helms and Rain Wilson are killing it in this episode. And so for one of my last thoughts, I want to talk about Lazy Scranton. I already spoke about how it's possible that this conversation in the initiation episode is what probably spurred Michael to create this video. Because they're acting all tough and everything, uh -huh. but what they were rapping about was Cupcakes, the Chronicles of Narnia. Having made several stupid videos like this in the past, I can't tell you how much this adds to the realism of the show. I watch this and imagine what an episode focused on just Michael and Dwight filming Lazy Scranton would have been like, let alone Michael's thought process during the filming of this. The Scranton Witch Project. I am so scared when people don't label their personal food. And also within Lazy Scranton, I love the reference to the healthcare. Control if you're bit by a spider, but check that it's covered by your healthcare provider! I thought I'd also point out that for some reason, on Netflix and the version I'm pulling from the DVDs, have a shortened version of Lazy Scranton in this episode. To watch the full video, see the link in the description. You gotta check it out. And while I gushed about Dwight, Michael is great in this episode. I don't even know what he's referencing here, but Steve Carell is such a delight. I thought it would either be an A or an A+, plus, but I completely forgot that there is an A++. Plus plus. <sighs> There's so much blissful ignorance behind Michael, but I do think that leads us to the deeper meaning. Why don't you explain this to me like I'm five? Interestingly, I think this episode has an undercurrent theme of desegregation in the United States back in the 50s which might sound weird, but stick with me. There is enough racial references in this episode to merit the consideration. Michael makes this statement, thus invoking race. If you follow me, I will show you where all the slaves work. Not so. Michael also makes this statement, again, invoking race. Welcome. Wow, you are very exotic looking. Was your dad a GI or? Martin invokes race. <laughs> Meredith invokes race in this deleted scene. I love your complexion. It's like devil's food cake. And not with malice, but nonetheless, Dwight says this in a deleted scene. Nash. Martin Nash. Okay. Male, age 37. Good. Mocha complexion. 
themselves. But even the integration ceremony that Michael puts on seems to be purposefully invoking desegregation, which was often called integration. That is why I created the integration celebration. This is the moment when Scranton and Stanford come together as one. It's clear they're doing something with this topic, I won't be talking so much in depth on the history here since there's so much content out there about desegregation in the form of articles, books, documentaries, and remember the Titans. Nothing come between us. We are team. Go watch that movie, it's so good. Anyway, the gist of the topic here surrounds a Supreme Court decision that outlawed racial segregation in public schools, deeming them unconstitutional. As a result, over the next decade, schools consisting mostly of white students and schools consisting mostly of black students were forced to consolidate into one school system. Often the black schools were shut down, with most of the teachers and staff being fired. This left a smaller group of black students joining a previously all-white school. So we're starting to see some parallels of what's happening in this episode. But what was the point of invoking all of this? A few things, I think. So first, the fact that change is difficult. Change is something that countless works of art have been produced on. We get it, it's hard. But imagine you're young, outdated ideals have been instilled in you since birth, and the way of life that's been effect for at least a few generations has now ended. You're now forced to be side by side with people that you think hate you, and you probably hate them for that. It's a recipe for disaster, and chaos most definitely ensued. We get a taste of this in the merger episode in the form of this sequence of vignettes that show characters annoying each other, exposing the difficulty they're having with adjusting to the change. This is the reason that Michael puts on the integration celebration in the first place. United in applause. Michael thinks that putting on a good show can somehow create a sense of unity, thus forcing them to forget their differences. But instead, and to my second point, Michael just ends up marginalizing a group of people. First, by calling them guests. Hey, champagne. No, no, guests only. It's not salmon. No, um, for the guests it is. For you, consider it cow meat. They're not guests. They're employees. Words matter, and what we call people matter. Guests would imply that they're only there for a short while. We should be careful when we apply a word to a group of people. Michael forcing the Stanford people up on a table only serves to make them feel more marginalized by bringing attention to their differences and making them self-conscious. What I want all of you to do is approach one of the new people and tell them the one thing that you like most about them. Who wants to start? Let's I give it a shot. Okay, Meredith, let's give it a shot. He did the same thing to Oscar earlier this season. Oscar, why don't you take this opportunity to officially come out to everybody here, however you want to do it. By the way, that's why Andy's very awkwardly sitting at Oscar's desk. Oh. Do you like it? I do like it, actually. Back to the point, I think the most scathing thing that's spoken in this episode comes from Andy. Because the angrier he gets, the more marginalized he becomes. Meanwhile, Andy Bernard is out there laying on the charm. Now, the writers seem to be hitting on something really important here. Can we all just get along? Or have we forgotten the words of the Reverend King? If you can make someone look like a fool in their anger, you cut the integrity of their argument right out from underneath them. Think about a time you got an argument with someone. You can be the most right anyone's ever been, but if your anger is out of control, it undercuts your point every time. Regardless, marginalizing people sidelines them, and with no support group, no way out, and all eyes on them due to them being on the fringes of society can only have unanticipated consequences. I don't know what I'm grabbing here. All right, all right, but stop, it feels good. Push it, push it. Out. Put it I'm out. right in your crap. Not Compliment accepted. Do you realize, Michael, that we now have to pay him severance? There's probably also something to be read into the fact that Kevin is literally shredding their files because Toby didn't want to file them. So searching for meaning here, I think at the end of the day, Michael is right in thinking that simply mixing the two environments might not be enough. Can we find each other and connect with each other in spite of these differences? No, we can't, but we have to try. The only thing that can conquer our differences is to personally have integrity and treat people with respect, or find a villain big enough that people will unite against them.
Man, they got us so bad. We cannot let them get away with this. We have got to pull together as one and steal their refrigerators. Yeah! Yeah? I don't, I don't think we can do that. Go home, Toby. Just, they saved the worst for me. They put a hate note under my windshield wiper. Check this out, it's so hateful. You guys suck! You can never pull together as one and revenge us. That is why you suck. This is egregious! What brings the kids together is hating the lunch lady. Although that'll change because by the end of the fourth grade, the lunch lady was actually the person I hung out with the most. Or I don't know, maybe this whole episode exists just to show us that Creed can do whatever he wants and not get fired. It's my left breast. How did you right place at the right time? But with that, let's get to the Dundies. And then I gotta get him to the Dundies. All right, so this Dundee needs a little setup before it gets unveiled. I was watching the merger for this review and I was interrupted by one of my children. Anyway, I paused this episode and when I came back, I saw something that both cracked me up and instantly gave me a great reference. So to announce this Dundee, I give you Michael Scott. The Doobie Doobie Pothead Stoner of the Year Award goes to Andy Bernard. <laughs> Dwight may have won the battle. Okay, maybe it's not as funny as I thought it was, but it did crack me up. All right, moving on. The Dundee for who is that guy goes to this guy. Would none be an accurate estimate? None advice? I tried to research this. I have no idea who this guy is. It's possible that he's another Stanford employee we've never seen, but it's more than likely he's just there to help even the frame out when Andy's response is center focus in the shot. Either way, it's been almost 14 years since this episode was released, and it's the first time I've ever even noticed this guy. So kudos to the cinematographer there. All right, with that, let's get to the trivia answer and the ratings. What gives what? What gives you the right? Okay, to answer that trivia question, I think it was an easy one, but what vehicles do Dwight and Andy drive during this part of the series? Bonus points if you know the year of Dwight's vehicle. All right, Dwight drives an 87 Trans Am and Andy drives an Xterra. Xterra is not even a real word. Actually, it is, it's Latin for Earth. Oh, so, so you drive an X-Earth. Yeah, that makes sense. I'd rather drive a classic Trans Am than an X-Earth. I think the cold opening is pretty great. Hey, is that Josh's computer? What? Dwight bragging about anything is great, and he does a lot of it in this episode. I could beat that on a skateboard. I am fast. To give you a reference point, I'm somewhere between a snake and a mongoose. And a panther. Fact. I am older. I am wiser. Do not mess with me. Okay, sounds good. What are you doing? Do you know anything about film? I know everything about film. I've seen over 240 of them. Congratulations. Anyway, Pam's prank is pretty good. I did just make him run around the building and I have no intention of timing him. This isn't even a stopwatch, it's a digital thermometer. Regardless, I give this one a three out of five. It's not great, it's fine. This episode though, it has a slow burn genius to it. I give it a four out of five. It is slow and it's not a nonstop laugh factory, but it is such a well-written episode. There's something genius about introducing and developing characters who have never experienced Michael Scott before, then thrusting them into that chaos. Movies, favorite men's magazines. You know what? I think you just need to meet them. Playing your cards close to the vest, I get it. It's just great. And there's still a ton to talk about in this episode. I didn't mention the Jim and Pam stuff at all. And also Kevin's odd storyline of shredding things, which leads to this great clip. Where'd you get that salad? Staples. But that's all I have to say about this one. What are your thoughts on the merger? What's your favorite stuff in this episode? Thanks for watching this. Consider subscribing if you enjoyed. We release one of these a week, and next week we'll be looking at The Convict. So as we close out today, let's say goodbye to Tony Gardner. Beat it, turd. Thanks, mister.